It's nice to be back um, in working with uh, EMMA and uh, all that it stands for. I've been uh, involved in uh, the EMMA organization um, and uh, looking at issues not just of social cohesion but uh, British diversity um, for since 2003 now. So it's very nice to sort of uh, be back uh, involved uh, with it. To the far right is uh, not a position he's used to being. <laughs> to my far right, to your, to your left, uh, is uh, Tony Benn, who I really do think needs no uh, in introduction. Um, has been a uh, political activist, campaigner, uh, social reformer um, for much of the modern political life of, of, of this country, uh, and, um, and is, uh, is well known to uh, everyone here. Thank you very much for inviting me. The way I look at it is that every generation from the beginning of time have always had people there who campaigned for equality, for justice, for democracy, for freedom. And uh, sometimes the campaigns succeed, sometimes they fail, sometimes they part succeed and part fail, but all of them leave behind a legacy that we can pick up and use. And what I remember most, and I think most people would say that, is the people who have really believed in what they've been doing and have sacrificed themselves and their lives often for that and that gives an authenticity to what they did and uh, every generation has to fight the same battle there's no final victory and no final defeat and uh, we are part there but we're not there fully by any manner of means and now of course for this generation we have to look at it globally when I was young uh, at school, I remember one teacher saying the only two sorts of people in the world, the British and foreigners, <laughs> and there were an awful lot of foreigners. And now, I think increasingly young people see the world as one and see themselves as members of the human race. And as a member of the human race, you still have to take up these campaigns uh, in circumstances that are more difficult, more diverse, but they're all occurring all over the world, and whether you're looking at the Arab Spring or whether you're looking back at the English Revolution, you'll find the same themes coming out. And uh, the one advantage of being seeing ourselves as members of the human race is that you realize that uh, there is no inherent reason why you can't have human rights. It's just that there are human obstacles that have to be overcome. Great, thank you very much, uh, Tony. Now, uh, <laughs> Neej uh Thank you, Ray. I was asked by Bobby to be controversial, <laughs> so I shall. <laughs> I believe in something far more fundamental, human dignity, which transcends legislation, which transcends uh, rights given by parliaments, assemblies, courts, judges. No, no, no. We are much more important than that. We have something called human dignity. And that human dignity is not given to us by any other human being. It's given by the Creator. That makes a whole series of legislative proposals much more comprehensive. It brings everyone together of every religion. And that is why I think we should promote more human dignity and not be as legislative as we have been, so that we all have come from the same point. Thank you. Thank you, Ned. What seems to be driving change at the moment is not human rights, not dignity, not democracy, not communism, not socialism, but econ economics. Yeah. yeah. And that is propelling change in Europe at the moment. Uh, uh, I, think you, uh, 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 I think you answered your own question, because that is exactly what is happening. In Italy, uh, Silvio Berlusconi uh, has been replaced by Mario Monti, who nobody has elected. And same in Greece. These are two of the places where democracy started. Mm. And we have today, in 2011, two of the member states of the European Union run by people who have not been elected. And nobody says anything about it. Because why? Because we know that they got to do a tough job and they don't have a political remit or a political party to support. Is it not, is it not time to start talking about the transformation of the economic system so that we don't have a, a system that is a, a kind of capitalist system that only emphasizes individual effort and individual reward mm. and tries to emphasize social uh, solidarity instead. 
It is in the interest of my country to do this on this occasion and not that on that occasion, mm. because there is no common why. But if we can introduce the concept of human dignity in any other world, not given to us by each other or by man, but given by at the moment of creation, mm. then we have a why which we can't be adrift of. And what the professor is saying about liber liberalism encouraging this sort of thing, and a, a, a non-liberal country not recognizing it, would there will be an inalienable right. I'm the Americans when they wrote their constitution uh, understood this, but it took them a heck of a long time to put it into practice. But they are beginning to do that. Lady there, just wanted to put a question to the panel. Um, in the face of the Islamic bogeyman, um, Barbara Ahmed has been incarcerated in this country for seven years without charge. Um, I'd like the panel to comment on the fact of the complete, blatant, blatant lack of human rights. I think the one thing I would say in answer to your particular question is that, yes, we, we have all sorts of things that go wrong uh, here. Uh, we have attempts by the executive uh, part of the legislature, which uh, you know I suspect Tony Benn and I uh, share the view that it's not a particularly good form of government when you have the executive as an inherent part of the legislature. Somehow the founding fathers in the United States got it much better by having the executive as a separate arm from, from the legislature. But that, but that said, where you have the, the attempt to incarcerate people for even longer periods of time, but at least remember what happened in Belmarsh was overturned by the courts. Well, my basic belief is a moral one. I think that uh, treating people wrongly is, is wrong, and that that is the final safeguard, that while there are people in their hearts believe it is wrong to do this, it will be difficult for governments to do it. But, of course, where injustice occurs, then people rise up and... Uh, uh, take military action. Uh, you mentioned terrorism in Northern Ireland, which is roughly what Assad is saying in Syria. He now says, I'm dealing with terrorism, and that justifies me in shooting people and depressing them and so on. And I think these are very difficult questions to deal with. My own view is that uh, you should talk to the people with whom you are in conflict. And uh, my experience of campaigns, if I if I may put it very simply, is to begin with, if you have a good idea, like votes for women, you're ignored. Then if you go on, you're described as mad. Then if you go on after that, you're described as dangerous, and they lock up the suffragettes. Then there's a pause, and then you can't find anyone at the top who doesn't claim to have thought of it in the first place. <laughs> and that is how progress is made. Now, of course, if there's bloodshed in the middle, <coughs> that makes it harder. But uh, uh, Peter Robinson has made an extraordinary speech in Northern Ireland yesterday, calling on the Irish people to come together despite their religious differences. And uh, I mean, that's something one would never have believed would have been possible when Paisley was there. But it shows the way in which opinion could be turned by a principled way of dealing with differences. Absolutely. There has been, do you not think, a step backwards with regard to this issue of torture? and. I mean, Eliza Manning and Buller, the former head of MI5, expressed it quite clearly in her Reith lectures that despite all of these, you know, dilemmas you face, it is not just, you know, most of the times not useful information you get, but it is just wrong and in many cases illegal and we shouldn't do it. The fact is that torture is as old as civilization. Torture is actually going on now as we're sitting here, um, probably just a few doors away in a street, but we call it domestic violence. It's still torture. But the real problem with torture is, is it is not something that is just dished down by tyrannical regimes. Torture is something that happens every day in police stations, in military camps and things like this. In some cases, it is so endemic in some countries that people don't even recognize it as torture. And, and one of the problems we have when people come from all over the world who've been tortured is uh, them trying to, uh, it, it being elicited from them that they have been tortured because many of them do not see the fact that they've been tortured as being a part of their protection claim. The Human Rights Act has given 
people who necessarily may not have had a voice, people with learning disabilities, mental health problems, people that are vulnerable, older people, uh, women. So, you know, I think, you know, we can't ignore that. Just to continue this theme around social cohesion, and um, uh, uh, interestingly that uh, there are groups actively out there today who are actively uh, campaigning in our communities to get rid of people, British people of colour, uh, significantly the uh, English Defence League. Mm. Now, one of, the, one of the, 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 the suggestions I would always have to people like that who have objection to people that look like me is, well, if you don't like me, you go, you leave this country, you know. I am here to stay and I, I've got nowhere else to so, go. I think you just have to be very, very careful that uh, you don't allow uh, the crisis to stimulate the far right who've always got an explanation that it's the foreigners who are causing the trouble. First of all, the far right only succeeds through either intimidation, the sort of thing Tony Benn was talking about, or ignorance or apathy. Ignorance and apathy are the two worst things of which we have to be really frightened in this country. There is an annual survey done uh, called the Transatlantic Trends Survey, funded largely through the German Marshall Fund, which surveys about seven or nine industrialized countries, always Canada and the United States, also, always this country, but other European countries as well, sometimes Spain, sometimes Italy. Year after year after year, consistently, British public opinion comes out as the most anti-migrant of all those countries. But what is even more depressing is that we also come out as the most profoundly ignorant. How far do you go in exercising freedom of speech, issuing racist and uh, pejorative comments which incite racial hatred or whatever. Well, we know the answer to that because we have laws dealing with it. Uh, there is a limit on the exercise of your right to free speech. Just because we have built up this much of body of legislation doesn't mean that we've suddenly become extremely civilized. Now, I, I spend most of my time spending your money on international development and there's a huge quantity of money I spend on your behalf, some 30 billion euro a year, dishing it out to de developing countries for promotion of transparency, democracy, human rights, all sorts of things, which we in the European Parliament do. And I often go to foreign, uh, to countries where these projects are being done, and I sort of am appalled at uh, the way we do it, because People are starving, other people are sitting around in fat Mercedes cars, running around in the same place, in the same, occupying the same, breathing the same air. Um, by the time we stop speaking today, in the two hours that I've been speaking, 600 people would have died of starvation in the world. 600. So 600 is about three jet aircraft. If three jet aircraft crashed in two hours, carrying middle-class Europeans, that would be headline news. But 600 people having their stomachs burst in, in Somalia or Sudan mm. or wherever is no news at all. So where is the right there? Mm. That's what I meant about every generation has to fight the same battles again and again and again. And I think the greatest safeguard of human rights are the people who campaign for them and won't give up and prepared to sacrifice their own interests in order to bring them about. And if you look at it that way, then you're less likely to sink into a sort of um, dangerous optimism that once it's written in law, mm. it's all over. Because I don't think the law works unless it has active support from people who would suffer if it was neglected. So that's the point that I was making, and I don't know if it's valid from your point of view, but it's the way I understand history. And when I look ahead, there's so many more campaigns ahead to be carried out to put these rights on a global scale that I can't think of any relaxation for the human race for many, many centuries ahead.